We're continuing our series called The God of All Comfort. And that's who God is to us. In fact, the role, one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to function as our comforter. And when we think about that, certainly it does away with a lot of misconceptions about the Holy Spirit. Many Christians seem to have an incredible view of Jesus, but the Holy Spirit is ticked off at them. How merciful and, and powerful and how gracious and kind is Jesus to give himself up for us. But then, wow, the Holy Spirit is really beating me up over my sins. And so we have Jesus and the Holy Spirit on different pages many times. Even in this series, we talked about the word convict. We say, Jesus took away my sins, but the Holy Spirit is convicting me. Remember, the word convict is reserved for an unbeliever. The Bible says that God convicts the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds. And Jesus said, when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will convict the world because they do not believe in me. Do you believe in him? If you believe in him, you're a believer. God is not treating you as a convict. When it comes to sin, he's saying, you're the righteousness of God and sin doesn't fit. Let me show you a better way. Let me walk you through the comfort and counsel of my spirit and I will guide you into all truth. And so the gentle and patient voice of God has been a theme throughout this series. And we continue today with the God of all comfort. We are in chapter 10, and I've sort of subtitled this chapter, Two Ways to Measure Yourself. Let's talk about what that means. You think about how the world measures itself. Every person, every citizen of this world is, is tempted to measure and compare ourselves with other people. Perhaps you're at a wedding and you meet someone new or you're at a cocktail party, or you're hanging out over at someone's house who's thrown a party, and you're meeting new people. You lean in to shake their hand. Maybe you get to say your name, maybe, but what is the first question that is asked of you? Give it 5, 10, 15 seconds, lean back in a posture like this, and get ready to receive the question, so what do you do? This question shows up very early in our interactions with other people. Depending on the desired outcome for me, I decide to tell them if I want them to kind of be quiet and go away, I say I'm a pastor. <laughs> if they seem cool and I want to hang out, I say I'm an author. And they're cool with that as long as they don't ask what kind of books. So I can get away with it for another 15 seconds before they shrink away in fear. But you see, we measure ourselves. What do you do? What do you do? What do you do for a living? Where do you work? Where'd you grow up? We try to gather information about other people, perhaps because we've grown up with this sense of needing to categorize people. We want to categorize. We want to label Sometimes we want to categorize, label, and dismiss, or categorize, label, and then try to impress. Have you ever found yourself giving your resume, so to speak, in a conversation, sliding in people that you've met or sliding in people that you know? You know, these very same people were doing that, the Corinthians. They were bragging on their, their baptism. They were bragging on who baptized them. They were bragging on who they'd met and who they knew. And they were carving out an identity to create a status. And we do that. We're tempted to carve out a status according to the things we've done. Or maybe there's some in this room that would say according to what we haven't done. And then that status seems to be lower. We're measuring ourselves we're comparing ourselves. We're carving out an identity according to accomplishment. Those of us who might be regarded as type A personalities, the driven type, well, there's always more. There's another hoop to jump through. There's another notch on the belt. There's another thing to accomplish so that then we can say that we've arrived. And now, now people will say. Now people will think. Now people will see. And we want to impress. 
Perhaps you married into a family that you thought you had to impress. The impression given to you was that we like you and we love you and we're glad that you married our own, but you need to rise up. Rise up and meet the standard. Perhaps it's at work as people get promotions and you don't. And you're surrounded by others who seem to be succeeding just a little bit more. We compare ourselves. We measure ourselves. We do all kinds of things to try to get right and stay right in our own minds. Today we're going to be seeing that system of finding value and worth and then comparing it with the destiny that is ours, the new way of value and worth that God has for us. Now I, Paul, myself, urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold towards you when absent. Now this is sort of a description of his two-facedness, if you will, but not in a negative way. It's just that the Corinthians have noticed that Paul seems to be very strong, very bold when he writes a letter. Have you noticed that? In the writings of Paul, you dogs, you foolish Galatians, who has tricked you? I wish you would just mutilate your... Wow. Wow. Whoa. Take a chill pill, Paul. But I mean, in his letters, he is bold and strong. And then he shows up in Corinth and he's kind of like, Hey guys, how's it going? Maybe I should do a teaching. And they're thinking, what? You're the guy that wrote the... I'm not even scared of you anymore, dude. And so they've got this dual relationship with Paul and they're trying to figure him out. Now, in a little while in this chapter, we're going to see Paul is saying, actually, I'm the same guy. I'm the same guy in, in both instances, and you're missing it. You need to be careful because what you're actually witnessing is a strength in humility, a stability in Christ that leads me to not have to tout myself like many of your Corinthian contemporaries who are so good and so eloquent and great debaters of the age. And that's that expectation you have for me, according to the flesh, that I'm going to come in like Plato or Socrates or something, the Christian Plato, and come in and debate your people and win and everybody's going to cheer at the end because of my great speech. Paul's saying, I came to you not in that style, but I came to you with a purpose. I came in humility and softness and gentleness, and it's the same me. But you need to recognize Christ when you see him. He's not always about bragging. He's not always about strength according to the flesh. And so he says, I ask that when I am present, I need not to be bold with the confidence with which I propose to be courageous against some who regard us as if we walked according to the flesh. You know what this tells me? That with believers who are seeking the message, seeking truth, if we're really seeking truth, we shouldn't care where it comes from. We shouldn't care about the resume of the person who's giving it. If truth is truth is truth, and if we love Jesus and we crave truth, then we shouldn't be concerned about accol accolades. We shouldn't be concerned about achievement. And so what he's saying is, who do I have to be courageous with? Those who challenge me and say I have no business being in ministry. That's what some of them are saying. Paul, you don't understand. We've got these super apostles over here. And I mean, you should hear them talk. They can paint anybody into a corner. They are incredible debaters. They are outlandishly entertaining to, to listen to. And Paul, you come in with that mousy little way and you're boring. And so he has to stand up, not for himself but for the fact that the Lord has commended him, the Lord has approved of him, the Lord has qualified him, and he has to stand his ground because he's bringing a gospel that those guys, quite frankly, those guys have messed up pretty badly. 
In some cases, it's a gospel that is no gospel at all. And so he says, I pr propose to be courageous against some who regard us as if we walked according to a resume that we fabricate, according to a worldly way of achievements. They get out their clipboard and they want to know what churches I visited, how many people were in attendance, what kind of reception I received, how many trips I do a year, and they would want Paul's resume writing these things down and then determining his value based on his achievements. For though we walk in the flesh, and this refers to the body, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. It refers to the body, but it also refers to getting a resume from the body, if you will. Let's think about what that means. How could you use your body for a resume? Well, certainly race could come into it. You could use your race to get some sort of status. And the Jews were doing that, weren't they? Not only with regard to race, but they were doing it with regard to tribe. They were doing it with regard to the day of their birth, when they were born. And so Paul had a resume based on his birth and his race and his tribe and then his obedience to the law, which had been given only to Israel. So you can see how this man could have walked around town with his chest stuck out with his nose in the air and making a big deal of himself. And at one time he did. And so he's saying we walk in this flesh, but we don't war according to the flesh. The only way to win is not to compare yourself and measure yourself. The only way to win is to discover God's measure for you. That you are perfect. You are perfect. People freak out about that. I'm not saying you're perfectly behaved. I'm saying you're perfectly righteous. You're perfectly forgiven. You're perfectly cleansed. And your status is perfect. Guess what a person who is perfect doesn't have to do? We don't have to go out and try to get perfect because he's already made us perfect. Any perfectionists out there in the audience uh, today? Any, any perfectionists among us? Of course, you wouldn't raise your hand because you're perfect, right? You, no, <laughs> no issues, right? How many of us have to get something right and keep something right in order to feel right so that we can feel okay, so that we can go to bed at night feeling good about us? The gospel is saying you can get off that train. You don't have to go there. It's over. When God makes you perfect, you don't have to try to be perfect. When God makes you righteous, you don't have to try to get right. And so Christians then can be marked by something peculiar. You meet 10,000 people who are on that train of self-improvement, then you meet one person that knows they're perfect. Something's different. Something's different. It's not flashy and showy, but something's different. There's a rest in her. There's a calmness in him. There's a peace in that person. They know that they are okay no matter what. They're not trying to impress me. They're not trying to... And you fill in the blank there, but we get so used to the flesh game of impressing other people. And what Jesus wants to do is invite us to get off that train and rest in Him. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. There are weapons. But see, the weapon, even as we think about the armor of God, the weapon is Jesus and the weapon is truth. I didn't get that promotion. What's the weapon for that? The weapon is my identity is in Christ not in the workplace. My identity is not in that factory. My identity is not in that office. My identity is not there. My identity is in Jesus. The neighbor, well, we hung out a few times, but the neighbor doesn't like me anymore. I'm not cool enough. <laughs> What's the weapon for that? The weapon for that is that God thinks the world of you, and you have intrinsic value that is unshakable. Nobody can take it from you. You are the righteousness of God. At school, 
you were in a group and you got some acceptance initially, but ultimately they sniffed you out. They found a reason to reject you. Maybe it was your faith. Maybe it was your personality, what they called something, something that was not likable to them. And they said, no, we're done. What's the weapon against that? Well, there is a weapon. In fact, there's maybe two or three. The first that comes to mind is we have to deal with that through this avenue known as forgiveness. Not that they would even know we did it, but I am not going to let their impression of me control me. I'm not going to let their impression of me define me. And so I, I choose to forgive them and release them from anything they owe me. What do they owe me? They owe me the red carpet, man. They owe me acceptance and love and hugs and embraces and time spent, and they owe me. And they're not paying either. So I choose to cancel that debt, and I forgive them and release them from what they owe me. And then I say, wait a minute, where's my value? Where's my worth? Who do I belong to? I belong to the God of the universe. You talk about being in the best club imaginable. I belong to the God of the universe. And so we have weapons, but they're not the weapons that people might imagine. In the Crusades, people imagined weapons. They went out and fought for the church with physical weapons. You see how we could get this wrong? We try to war according to the flesh. And the battle is at the battlefield of the mind. And the weapons that we wield have to do with the truth in Jesus Christ that we now possess. So there is a war going on right now. There's a war for our children, those who are in Christ and our children. There is a war against our youth, those of us who are young in Christ. There is a war going on in every single one of our lives. And the war is that the enemy desires to say, come over here and do it this way, and it'll work out great for you, and you can compare yourself and measure yourself and just come over here and look to this. And if you just are successful in this, then people will take hold of you, they will embrace you, they will love you, and you will find value and worth. And maybe we go down that rabbit trail for a time, maybe we do. But the weapons that we have to come back to have to do with who we are in Jesus Christ. Identity in Christ is not a feel-good movement. It is the only response to the attacks of the world and the flesh and the devil. There is a war. It is a war for your attitudes. The enemy cannot have your spirit. The enemy cannot have your soul. It is a war for your attitudes, a war for your affection, a war for your attention. And so those who, as Paul would say, take every thought captive, we end up saving ourselves a whole lot of time and a whole lot of energy spent going in the wrong direction. He says, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. I want to take a moment for us to think about what it means that there might be speculations and lofty thoughts that are raised up against the knowledge of God. You know, many people might read this and they might think, oh, yeah, 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 you know, this is about apologetics, arguing for the existence of God, arguing that uh, Jesus died on a cross, arguing that he rose from the dead, arguing uh, that, you know, uh, there's a way to salvation and we need to prove that and fight against every argument that would contradict it. I don't think that's what Paul means here. What I think Paul means is there is a true knowledge of God. There's a knowledge of his goodness. There's a knowledge of his kindness. There's a knowledge of his character. There's a knowledge of how good he is toward us. And then there are lofty notions about God that aren't true. They seem true. They seem, they're very religious. They seem spiritual. They seem right. And they make much to do about, well, about achieving for God. And that's what he's talking about here, right? Achieving for God according to the flesh. Well, the knowledge of God would say, hey, 
you know what? I'm for you. I'm with you. I'm in you. I'm in your camp. I think you're perfect. I find no fault in you. As my friend Ralph Harris once said that God said to him, I find no fault in you. I love that little statement. You know, I've said many times, there's nothing wrong with you. And people go, wait, come on, spend a day with me and I'll prove you wrong on that. Christ Jesus lives in your spirit. Your soul is going to heaven too. Your body is called the temple of the Holy Spirit, holy and acceptable. What's wrong with you? Look, that old way to act, that old way to carve out resume, there's something wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with you. That's why you don't have to act that way. Because there's nothing wrong with who you are. God made you perfect. And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. Does it sound like you're going to be punished? No, you're not going to be punished. Not even by Paul. This is Paul and the apostles who are talking. This is not God's punishment. But does it sound like you're going to be punished? Now, they're going to wait till your obedience is complete. And then they're going to punish all disobedience. What does that mean? He's talking about taking every thought captive and then pummeling it. Forget you, man. That's what he's talking about. See, if it were about you and your disobedience, what do you call your disobedience? Your disobedience is called sin. What did Jesus do? He died for your sins. He took away your sins. He remembers your sins no more. You're not going to be punished for your disobedience. What Paul is saying, we saw the previous verse, I take every thought captive, and then what do I do with it? I punish it. Punish all disobedient thoughts. Forget them. So many have misinterpreted this verse but in light of the finished work of Jesus Christ, it becomes crystal clear. You are looking at things as they are outwardly. If anyone is confident in himself that he is Christ, let him consider this again with himself, that just as he is Christ's, so also are we. You think you're something, Paul is saying. Look, I belong to Jesus too. Give me a break, man. That's what he's saying. He's standing up, but not in a way to be superior. He is using the fact that the Lord commends him, the Lord approves him, the Lord qualifies him to say, wait, you need to regard me as someone who carries the message. Listen up. For even if I boast somewhat further about our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be put to shame, for I do not wish to seem as if I would terrify you by my letters. You ever felt terrified by Paul's letters? Apparently he knows that sometimes he's accidentally terrifying people. And you know what? There are whole seminaries that have been started and built on trying to wrestle and grapple with the difficult words of the Apostle Paul for the last 2,000 years. But there's something curious here I want us to look at. There's something that I think deserves attention, and it's this little phrase, building you up and not destroying you. That's how you know that you're hearing the truth. Do you see it says here, the Lord gave Paul authority. He gave him authority for one thing. What is it? The building up of the church, the building up of other people, not destroying. Can you imagine what that other message does? Look at me. Look at what I'm doing. Look at what I've accomplished. Now, how about you? Have you ever heard a message like that? Perhaps you have been in some place where you're challenged every week. You're challenged every month to be a better person and be more like the person on stage Watch out for that. When we compare ourselves with ourselves, we end up having no understanding. What we need to understand is that when we fix our eyes on Jesus, His heart is to build us up. If you're believing a bunch of garbage about Jesus, it's going to tear you down and destroy you. The point of the gospel is to build you up in Him and encourage you so that we're rooted and grounded in the grace of God. For they say his letters are weighty and strong. Look at this. His personal presence is unimpressive. And, and his speech, contemptible. I mean, awful. Like he says, ain't a ton. 
so annoying. Well, Paul says, let such a person consider this, that what we are in word by letters when we're absent, such persons we also are in deed when present. So I'm not two different people. Here's your problem. You've got a phantom Christian in your mind. You have imagined me, the Apostle Paul, up here as some sort of strong, amazing, always flashy and showy, always incredible looking dude. And then you've been probably comparing yourself with that image, not to mention you've been turning your head over here to these so-called super apostles and looking at their speech and looking at their wittiness and looking at their ability and looking at their talent and saying, I got to be like that. That's a person who's arrived. That's a person who is at God's right hand. And so you've been distracted by the phantom Christian and then by pursuing super achievers. And you need to know something that when I show up in town and I'm not making a big deal of myself, you know what? Same message. Same message as I write you about. Because when you know who you are, you can walk in a calmness and a stability and a security because you have infinite worth and value and you don't have to prove yourself to anybody. Amen? Amen. For we are not bold, we'll finish with this, we are not bold to class or compare ourselves with some of those who commend themselves. But when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, sound familiar? They are without understanding because they're looking at the wrong person. I'm looking at you and you're looking at me and you're looking over here at this person and they're looking back at you and we're going, how can I get like that? And we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. And when we do... He says it's like looking in a mirror dimly, but it's like looking in a mirror. You need to remember who you are, and he's going to tell you who you are. And he says, you're beautiful, you're perfect, there's nothing wrong with you, I find no fault in you, you are incredible to him. That is the voice of God himself. But he who boasts is to boast in the Lord, for it is not he who commends himself that is approved, but he whom the Lord commends. What did we see today? Thank God we don't have to measure ourselves and compare ourselves according to the flesh. Thank God we are approved by God himself because of, he, of who he made us, not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So let's boast. Let's brag. But not in our resume from the past. Let's boast in the Lord and what He has to say. And when we fix our eyes on Him, we'll be impressed with what He's done for us and impressed with what He's done to us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for the two ways that we see now there's two ways to measure ourselves, to compare ourselves, to try to, quote, fix ourselves. We want to improve and fix and change and compare and measure. And you have shown us it'll never work. It's a dead-end street. Father, we thank you for the way to life, the way to stability, the way to rest, that we can get off that train and trust you trust you to show us who we are, that we're, we have everything we need for life and godliness, that we're complete, that we're lacking nothing, that we're qualified, that we're clean and close, that you by one offering have made us perfect. We renounce perfectionism, we renounce self-improvement, and we hold tightly to the simple and straightforward message that we are the righteousness of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.